Good morning and welcome to Bethlehem Lutheran Church in Chesterton, Indiana. A special welcome to those from St. Luke United Lutheran Church in Michigan City who are joining us. We gather today to celebrate the 10th Sunday after Pentecost. And we begin today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. O God, our defender, storms rage around and within us, and cause us to be afraid. Rescue your people from despair, Deliver your sons and daughters from fear, and preserve in us the faith of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading for today comes from the book of 1 Kings, the 19th chapter. At Horeb, the Mount of God, Elijah came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazal as king over Aram. Also you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And your son, you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, and Abel, Meloah, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazal, Jehu shall kill him. And whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, 
Elisha shall kill. Yet I leave seven thousand in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Here ends the reading. I invite you now to join us in reciting Psalm 85 responsively. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying, for you speak peace to your faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to you. Truly, your salvation is very near to those who fear you, that your glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Faithfulness shall spring up from the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness shall go before the Lord, and shall prepare for God a pathway. Our second reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans, the 10th chapter. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is, the word of faith that we proclaim, because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart, and so scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to proclaim without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Here ends the reading. Alleluia! I wait for you, O Lord. In your word is my hope. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time the boat battered by the waves was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong winds, he became frightened, and began beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. O you of little faith, why did you doubt? 
I've always found that part of the story of Jesus' miracle of walking on the water a bit disconcerting because I've always heard it as a parent scolding a disobedient child. I've always heard that dreaded tone of, I'm very disappointed in you. You know, the tone that maybe you've used or heard yourself, the one that hurts worse than any punishment, because you know that you have let the person you look up to down. I find it really disconcerting because I hear that tone in Jesus' voice. And thinking of Jesus scolding Peter for doubting, well, it always made me feel a little afraid of Jesus. Because let's be honest, I've definitely doubt more than my faith tells me I should. And I think that is a very true reality of being a human being. We doubt. We don't trust. It's our nature. So if God and Jesus knows our nature, why? Does Jesus scold Peter? Again, it seems as if Jesus is already adding salt into an open wound. Because if I can take a bit of literary license at this point, Peter is already criticizing himself in his head for doubting. And it probably felt as if Jesus was confirming every insecurity that Peter had about himself. If we take what Jesus is saying in the tone of chastisement and disapproval. But what if, what if we heard the voice of Jesus incorrectly in this statement? What if Jesus is not chastising Peter, but comforting him? What if this is not a moment of shame, but a moment of hope? You know, one thing that I've learned about life from getting my bachelor's degree in history is that everything happens must be understood within its context. For example, women not going to the polls to vote. If we were to see in a headline today, women are not voting, many of us might be outraged, while others may be confused. But if we were to see it in a newspaper of, say, 1910, we might see it in a different light. It was not societally acceptable for a woman to vote at that time, especially if she had a husband, because that husband's vote should have covered both members of the couple. Context matters. And understanding the scriptures and the stories of the Bible is no different. If we are to look at this story through the lens of a 21st century American frame, we lose so much of its meaning, which is found in the story's background. So if you will, I'd like to take some time to create a frame, a context for what's going on here. Some of you may have heard me preach on the calling of the disciples, but for those who haven't, let me give you the Reader's Digest version. In biblical times, everyone did not follow a rabbi, and it wasn't commonplace for a rabbi to say to someone, Come, follow me. No, for a rabbi to say to a boy, and to be honest, it was always a boy, come and follow me was a point of great honor and privilege. Because for a rabbi to say that, the teen would have had to have been not only top of his local synagogue school, but also his regional religious school. And he would have had to pass a rigorous oral exam given by the rabbi. It would have been like getting an acceptance letter to Harvard or Yale or any of the Ivy Leagues. Only the best and the brightest were invited by the rabbi to come and follow him. But why is that? What did it mean to follow a rabbi? To follow a rabbi at that time and in that place did not just mean learning what the rabbi taught but it also meant becoming just like the rabbi. And so when a rabbi said to a boy, come, follow me, what the rabbi is really saying is, I truly believe that you can be like me, 
that you can do what I do. It's not just a matter of learning and understanding. It is a matter of truly and fully being. And knowing that, and thinking back to when Jesus calls his disciples, particularly in Matthew's gospel, Jesus is walking down the shore, and he sees Peter and Andrew, James and John, and he calls out to them, Come, follow me. He doesn't ask for recommendations, nor does he give them an oral exam. He simply calls to them to follow. But here's the other thing. Peter and Andrew, James and John, they aren't following another rabbi which they would have been by this point, if, if they were good enough. But instead, they are mending their nets and hauling in fish. They were plying the family trade, which is what most men at the time did. But Jesus sees these B-team guys, and he says, follow me. He says, I believe that you can do what I do. And you can be what I am. I have faith in you. Let me repeat that. Jesus says, I have faith in you. Holy moly. Let's stop there for just a moment. Because that bit of context blows a huge amount of what we understand about scriptures, about our proverbial water, and it blows them up out of that proverbial water, so to speak. Because we have always been taught that to have faith is to have faith in God, Jesus, the Spirit, the Trinity, God three in one and one in three. To have faith is to trust the divine. But it has never been the norm to think that God, Jesus, the Spirit, also has faith in us. But it's true. So now that we have that context, let's get back to Peter sinking in the water after taking this massive leap of faith and getting out of the boat to meet Jesus in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus saying to Peter, You of little faith. Why did you doubt? Do you see a difference here? It's not that Peter doubts Jesus, but in his moment of trial, Peter calls out to Jesus to save him. No, Peter doubts himself. And he doubts Jesus' belief that Peter can be like Jesus. He doubts that he will ever be able to do that which God has literally called him to do. That is to share the good news of God's love and redemption. And so when Jesus says to Peter, You of little faith, why did you doubt? He's not chastising Peter, but comforting him because of the unspoken sentiment behind those words. And that unspoken sentiment is, why did you doubt? Because I, Jesus, God incarnate, have faith in you. I have called you Peter, and you are Peter on whom I build my church. You are the rock. Jesus is giving Peter hope that God knows what Peter can do. Jesus believes in Peter and the disciples, but God also believes in someone else. Any guesses as to who that is? Us. God believes that we can be like God, and that is why we were and are called in the waters of baptism to live daily as children of God, to lead lives worthy of the gospel. Because God believes that we can be like God. And God believes that we can live lives of love and compassion for all that is around us, changing the world one step at a time. 
You know, last week at St. Luke's worship service, I asked the question, what is keeping you from going out into the world and sharing the good news of the gospel? What is it that is holding you hostage to the idea that we must reserve this good news for ourselves? When are we going to realize not only that we can share the good news of Christ's death and resurrection and God's ultimate act of redemption, but that we must, absolutely must, share it? What is it that truly keeps us from living the life that God believes we can lead? Doubt. And more specifically, doubt in ourselves. We doubt that we can make any difference. We, like Peter, have very little faith in ourselves. And we doubt ourselves and our ability to be agents of change and prophets of mercy in this world. We think that somehow we are not good enough, that the people won't listen, or that somehow what we do doesn't make a difference. And I'm here to tell you this. You are dead wrong. Yes, you. You and you and you can be like Christ. And you can serve in his image. And if we consider what Jesus said about the mustard seed from two weeks ago, that if we had faith the size of a mustard seed, that we could move mountains? Well, what if we read that as, if you had faith, the faith that God has in you, the size of a mustard seed, you, that is the plural y'all, could move mountains. And think about it. What could we accomplish if we thought we could be like Jesus? Whose lives could we transform? What ministries could make an impact beyond our own backyard? What angels would we entertain without even knowing it? How could God use us, the people of Bethlehem, the people of St. Luke United, to be beacons of hope in a weary world? And how can we realize and remember that God believes we can do just that? We remember each time we come to the font and to the table. For God gave us these great gifts of sacraments to help remind us that we are called to this life of service to the world, not only through our words, but through our thoughts and our deeds. But what if we don't get it right? What if we sink, so to speak? What if we aren't perfect? God will reach out God's hand and say, Why did you doubt? I believe in you. Believe in yourselves. For God does not demand perfection. For God knows that only God is perfect. But nonetheless, he calls us, as that old poem says, to be his hands, to be his feet, and to be his body in the world. For in being Christ's body, God trusts that we, y'all, can be like Christ. Have faith in God, but also in the knowledge that God has faith in us. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you now to open your hearts and minds as we hear special music.
I invite you now to join us in confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident of your care and upheld by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need, responding to each petition with the words, save us, we pray. For your church throughout the world, we pray, strengthen the faith of all who believe, speak to us through your word of power and mercy, abide with those Christians who are isolated from others, give wisdom and stamina to all preachers, who bring your good news to the world. Hear us, holy God. Save us, we pray. For the well-being of your creation, we pray. Protect waterways, forests, lands, and wildlife from exploitation and abuse. Tame the storms that threaten human habitation. Maintain the health of pets. Hear us, holy God. Save us, we pray. For the leaders of nations, we pray. Inspire those who govern to keep peace with their neighbors and to maintain justice for their citizens. Calm the world's violence, strengthen the world's democracies, and keep autocrats in check. Uphold a free press around the globe. Hear us, holy God. Save us, we pray. For those in need, we pray. For those who are unemployed or homeless or hungry or hospitalized. For those whose money has run out. For those who are fearful of the future. And for those we name before you now. Hear us, holy God. Save us, we pray. For the world facing the coronavirus, we pray. Sustain medical workers for their arduous tasks. Assist our Congress and governors in legislating wisely during the pandemic. Give wisdom to educators as they plan the fall semester. Give us kindness with one another and patience for ourselves. And we beg, give us a vaccine. Hear us, holy God. Save us, we pray. For the end to racial injustice, we pray. Frustrate all prejudices between peoples that are based on ethnic origin or skin color. Unite into one body, politic, all who share this land. Hear us, holy God. Save us, we pray. We praise you, O God, for all who have died in the faith, for martyrs, for leaders in the struggle for civil rights, for victims of COVID-19 for those dear to us. Especially this week, we glorify you for Mary, the mother of our Lord. Bring us at the end with all your saints into your everlasting life. Hear us, holy God. Save us, we pray. In the certain, certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you now to make your offerings unto the Lord, whether they be time, talent, or treasures. For those who are gathering with us virtually, we thank you for all of the gifts that you have given. We thank you for the time that you have spent with us and the time you spend with your brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you for your many talents, which are innumerable to name. And we thank you for sharing your treasures with us, 
so that we might be a beacon of hope in the world. Amen. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love. Through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The body of Christ given for you, and the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. God of the welcome table, in this meal we have feasted on your goodness and have been united by your presence among us. Empower us to go forth sustained by these gifts so that we may share your neighborly love with all, through Jesus Christ, the giver of abundant life. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord, sharing Christ's love by serving all. We thank you for joining us virtually, and we look forward to that time in which we can safely gather again. Please now enjoy a moment to give your heart to the Lord in which we hear the prelude.